Hi everybody. <clears throat> so I've decided to do chapter two outside because it's I find being outside one can connect with God far easier than if we closed into confined things. Because nature just shouts God all the time. So I thought I'd just come outside. It's a little chilly. So always be a bit warm but feel the nice cool breeze. So welcome, I hope you enjoyed the first session and we continue with our continuative living and we will go on to chapter 2 today, okay? <clears throat> now, there are seven sections in the journey that we are taking together. The first section, and we're still in our first section, is about an invitation into a deeper journey. That's what meditation is, okay? And then we're going to go into part two, which is about the inner transformation that happens when we go into this deeper journey. And then the, the third part is about becoming still. Becoming still. Yeah, fantastic. That's all part of the journey. And then when we have... Start, when we start learning to be still, then there'll be a section where we learn how to let go. We let go of all the anxieties and all the things that inhibit our freedom. And then we, in chapter, in part five, an invitation to knowing ourselves more deeply the real essence of who we are as individuals, uniquely creating the image and likeness of God. The following section would be about transforming our pain. Everybody has pain. People tell us, that, tell me, oh, you're just being a pain. Well, that's fine, yeah, sure, that's real. So how can we transform this pain? That's the more real thing. And then the flowing outwards. So you see that loving the Lord your God, your neighbor and yourself. It starts with yourself. Once you get to know that, then we can truly love others. When we're loving from the God center, not the head center. Most of our giving, even in my own life, is from my head, not from my heart. And so it's my ego telling me what I should do, not my heart. So it's not really me giving or God giving through me. It's me deciding and manipulating what I should give. Anyway, so last week, remember we're in chapter one and chapter in the first section now, an invitation into a deeper journey. We're kind of just explaining a little bit about this deeper journey. Last week we spoke about I don't want to lie to you, the inner freedom that we have of the depth dimension. And we spoke about how we can get into that depth dimension. And today we're going to talk about discovering God in our depth. Discovering God. Okay, let's pray. Just be quiet for a moment. Heavenly Father, you have created everything that we know and we see and we feel and we touch, and everything we experience, and yet somehow we still keep looking for you on the outside when you are not only on the outside of what we see and believe, but you are deep within. Help us, Lord, to understand this truth and to be confident as we learn how to live it. Amen. So, here we go. Okay, so the first quotation I'd like to read, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. It's right there in chapter 2. If you've got the book, if you haven't got the book, I'm going to present it so that you don't really need the book. But if you want to, I can get it um, for you. Okay. So, David Brenner says, to be human, in other words, 
to be fully human being, to live this full life that we are to desperately want, to be human is to have feet of clay, but divine DNA. Isn't that a nice little ring to it? Feet of clay, but divine DNA. The interweaving of the divine and the human in our depths is the reason that movement from our circumference to our center is always such an essential part of any awakening and any authentically transformative spirituality. Ah, we're getting into it, aren't we? So, when we go in, that's when we start to really transform. Okay, now let's have a look at it in the scriptures. So maybe you just think we're being a bit bonkers here, and we're just sucking this out of thin air. Oh no, it's all in the scriptures, dear people. Ha ha ha. So, Genesis 3. You know the story where Moses goes and sees the burning bush, and he goes there, and God says to him, he says, to him, what's going on? So God says, I am who I am. Isn't that fascinating? Name that Jesus gives himself. He says, I am. The self-naming process talks about God being the most centralized being in the here and now. And there he is with Moses. He's saying, I am here now. As you see me in this bush, I am. Startling. He's in the here and now. Let's look again at another scripture text that Sharon gives us in Genesis 20. Eight. Genesis 28 and this is the story where Jacob is dreaming and he sees the angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth heaven to earth feet of clay divine DNA you see that beautiful movement and then when Jacob wakes up he says no this is a holy place why? Because as he was dreaming, he was having an encounter with God. Where was that encounter with God? Yes, in a physical place, but more importantly, it was within Jacob himself. It wasn't the place that made it evident. It was his openness to God in that moment. The phrase that <clears throat> becomes our main focus here is, for Moses, uh, for, for Jacob. Surely the Lord is in this place. But I was not aware of it. So when he came into that space, before he had the dream, God was already there, but he was not aware of it. But what about ourselves? How often is God here? in our lives, but we're simply unaware. Contemplation shows us a way of being aware of God, no matter where we are physically. Why? Because we have feet of clay, but divine DNA. I love that phrase from David. Benner. And the evidence that we are so often unaware <clears throat> of this reality is that so much of our religious institutions, of our, in, 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 our religious orientation, like being a Catholic or any other religion, is the way we formulate our ideas of God. Do we have the right idea? Is God like this father? Or is, is he like that father? What does God really look like? What does God mean, father? 
a priest often gets these uh, these questions. And we have this whole moralizing thing that goes on and on within us, and we have this great guilt trip that we inherit, and we pass on, unfortunately, to next generations. Where this is right, and this is wrong. If you love God, this is the way to go. If you don't love God, then you're going to be doing this. And it becomes a preoccupation of the clay rather than the divine DNA. When we try to be over-religious, and this is a great temptation on our spiritual journey, we want to be so right and do everything right and be so strict. We have lots of ideas and we theologize about God. We want to know whether we're right or wrong. But what we are actually doing is we're missing out on experiencing God, of truly knowing God. The Sharon says that much of our religion is therefore theological and moral rather than experiential. Shall I read that again? Because that is not disrespect for theology or even for moral theology, but it puts the experience of God as more important than theology and the study of right and wrong behavior. Because when we have an experience, a felt experience, when our feet of clay can feel the divine DNA, then we know that in this place and in this time, there is a gate of heaven that we can enter through. But are we always aware of it? Because God is present 24-7, 365 days of the year. But are we present to that presence of God? German mystic Meister Eckhart said God is closer to me than I am even to my own self fantastic writer God is closer to me than I am even to my own self if we created in God's image and likeness surely he must be closer to us then we can conceptualize ourselves being present to him. And then there is this image of a well. Beautiful. When we go into this inner journey, it's an invitation to encounter God directly, face to face. As Moses in the burning bush, Jacob, the ladder, trying to have a face-to-face, -face, and don't we always want this? And the more we go into this interior space, into the well of our being, we see this is where God is dwelling. Within me. To know yourself deeply and truly from deep within yourself is to know God as well. Now that's important. So let's look at a well. A well is deep. A well, traditionally, has life-giving water. The deeper we go, the closer we get to this life-giving water. But so often our life expectants uh, the, the things we're expecting in life, the things that are distracting us, us in love, are like rocks and grit and all these kinds of things that can fill a well. So if we're feeling kind of disturbed and we kind of feel that our lives are not really going anywhere, that the, everything that happens is, a chaos, is chaos for us and it's a catastrophe 
If we can't find the peace, then we need to go into this well and slowly, methodically start to clean out the well. And the well needs to be cleaned out of our external expectations, our external theories, our external rights and wrongs, and discover that beneath this grit and all the burdens and the baggages and the harshness of life is a divine presence within us. We have to dig. Richard Raw, one of my favorite writers, says, when you move to non-dualistic thinking, in other words, when you move from this black and white thinking, when you move away from that, God is no longer out there, but not just in here either. You see? Neither black nor white. Black nor white. He's not just out there only or in here only. No. God is always experienced in the soul. Aha. Richard Raw says, and at the same time, as totally beyond and mysterious. You see how huge this is. I'm getting to know God intimately within myself, but that's not that's not limiting God. So it's not this new age idea of I am God. No, nothing like that at all. Get rid of it. That's not what we do. We're not doing some weird thing joining our cult, that I am the most important. Oh, no, 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 no. I am part of such a great reality that is so awesome that I will never be able to understand the beauty of the mystery. God is, and Richard Rossi, God is mo both intimate and ultimate. Isn't that great? Oh, Richard Raw is a great, 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 great man. Oh. God is both intimate and ultimate. Fantastic. The point is that we often feel separated from God because we've been looking for God beyond. We, so we rush, uh, don't we? I love going on pilgrimage to Israel. Is God more real in Israel than he is here? Absolutely not. There's historical presence there, and there's a, it's sacred ground. And you see millions of people rushing and pushing and shoving. I want to put my hand in the hole where the cross was. When you put it away. And you, every, people are telling you to shh and shh. And there's all these different uh, denominations of Catholics, the, the Franciscans and the Greek Orthodox, and they don't really like each other because they're so holy in this church and people want to go put their hand in it. And you don't always have this holy experience. Why? Because we're looking outside and not inside. Go there in the morning. When all the priests and that are doing whatever they're doing, and you find the little old ladies going up there. And those little old ladies, they sit there and they pray and they bring a presence. They're not there to rush and light candles and do this and push and shove. Oh no. They want to sit there realizing the God within is resonating with a historical God that has been in this place. Jesus Christ. But we feel separated because we often look for God in the wrong places. That He's out there, separate from us. Absolutely not. Sharon gives in, as she does so beautifully, she was saying that she had to travel this journey. She was brought up, she's not a Catholic, but like many Catholics, but with very strict doctrine, do's and don'ts. And to be liberal and th free thinking only came later. 
But what she wanted in her love was a very real experience of God. She wanted something that was meaningful and real. And so she went on this journey of discovery. This journey of understanding who is God? The God that we speak about in church and the God we feel, they're the same God. But we don't have to separate God. He is both intimate and our ultimate. Yeah. And during this process, Sharon was saying, as most of the mystics will say, she started to find it very difficult because she was always told that if you did things right, you did things in a certain way, then you were in favor with God. Oh my Lord, look at us Catholics. It doesn't, this theology, this way of thinking, this way of praying, doesn't negate any of that. It actually puts it in its beautiful perspective so you can get more out of the rituals than before. But if we're doing the rituals because we have a sense of guilt, if I don't do it, I'm doing something wrong, well, that's why our youth leave the church. That's why people who are already thinking and want a spiritual journey are disturbed because they feel they can't get what they need and they can. That's sad. Because all churches should lead us to a different experience of God. And so as we go deeper into the silence and we read about this presence of God within ourselves, you will start to see that God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And that's a quote from Thomas Merton. We start to discover that God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. The inner journey involves being present to our life, in our body, in the present. It is not some outer goal that we try to reach together, but rather a coming home to ourselves. It's an incredible acceptance on a whole new level of ourselves, no matter what our history, no matter what chaos is around us. But we learn, because we discover the God within us who is always there, never absent, is the one that gives us the consolation that we are seeking. We learn to become present in our lives as it is, not as we want it to be, but as it is right now. And going deep into who and where we are and find there is incredible rich, there's an incredible rich source of life and nourishment already there within ourselves. Have you ever wondered why certain people seem to be so resilient or appear to be more resilient than others. Look at Mother Teresa. Where was she getting all this energy and focus? Even in her dark years, she was able to get and feel the source of life and nourishment. Because as God resides within us. John O'Donnell, who writes something really beautiful, and I want to read it for you. There is a place in the soul that neither time nor space nor no created thing can touch. What that means is that your identity is not equivalent to your biography. Your identity is not equivalent to your biography. And that there is a place in you where you have never been wounded. 
this digress a little bit. I wonder how often I've thought of myself as a dysfunctional person or a wounded person and I'm never going to get and get to a stage where I am perfect. Well, I was perfect once with no sin. That was when I was conceived. When I was born. That's where the corruption slowly started to take place. Not from people who are ill-intentioned. Just because that's the way of the world. But there's a place within me that has never, ever been wounded. That speaks so hugely to me. Because so often I spend time thinking, oh, I'm being wounded here, yeah, this person said that against me, blah, 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 blah. But in me is a place where I've never, ever been wounded. Contemplation helps us to go to that place where we have never been wounded, where there is still a sureness in ourselves, a certainty of our, of our being loved where there is seamlessness in you, and where there is a confidence and tranquility in you. Aren't these words beautiful? A confidence and tranquility. Not because everything's going well, not because I have all the money I need in the world and my life is perfect, no. But because I know I'm loved just that. And I think that the intention of prayer and spiritually and love is now and again to go into this inner sanctuary. That's what contemplation helps us to do. Another quote from Father Bill Whittier. He says, the beginning and end of our journey is the cave of the heart. The cave of the heart is the deepest psychological ground of one's being. It is the inner sanctuary where self-awareness goes beyond analytical reflection and opens out into metaphysical and theological confrontation with the abyss of the unknown yet always present. So you see how the inner and the outer, the interior, the intimate and the ultimate, they just flow. And then Sharon ends this chapter with a lovely um, reflection of one of her silent retreats. And she says that my sinking deeper into the now, into the present, to understanding God is with me in this particular moment. By staying present and open to what is, this is how the taproot of my heart sinks into the fertile ground of being. So it's the being aware through contemplation, through the practice of it, that helps your awareness sink into this ground of being. Beautiful stuff. And so as it sinks down, that grit and the stones and all the other bits and pieces that might be the old bones and the memories and the hassles that are in the well start to come up and to be taken out. We don't need this now. Because the divine space where I've never been wounded is starting to show itself. And I'm starting to see it and grow confident with it. The deeper we sink our roots into the inner source of life, and the more we clear the grit and stones of our own head noise, that's a word that Sharon uses often, the head noise, and the self-constructed identity, as, as soon as we take that away, the more we become channels for this life to flow 
through us and ultimately to others. So when we've gone into our well and we've learned the practice on learning the practice of contemplation, because you never get it perfect, but we see the fruits of it many times in life. And we start taking all this dirt out and the pre not dirt, but preoccupations and distractions. And we allow that beauty to come out, then we can share that with others. Automatically it happens. Another quote from Cynthia, and I can't pronounce her surname. I really am sorry. And to spell it will probably confuse you because I'm not a good speller. But anyway, so Cynthia Bergeretti, something like that, but wonderful person. I hope she doesn't ever hear me to say her name. She'll probably want to shoot me. No, she wouldn't. She's a very spiritual person. It'll just be one of those things that she'll forget. Okay, now, she says here, she says, as the practice becomes more and more established in you, so that this inner sanctuary begins to flow out into your life, it becomes more and more the place where you come from. It is a bedrock of spiritual intelligence, a sense of connectedness known from so deeply within you that nothing can shake it. And we've seen that in people's lives from time to time. Nothing can shake. This is the ground, she says, Cynthia says, of what tradition calls theological hope. So we're going deeper and we're still doing all the theology. Two for the price of one. The hope that can never be taken away. Because you simply know you're abiding union in this place of interconnectedness. You know that nothing can fall out of God. How can anything fall out of God? So if I'm in God, I'm not going to be falling out of God to be doing something wrong. No, 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 no. I can't possibly be falling out of God. Only from the level of spiritual awareness do you begin to see and trust that all is held in the divine mercy. Mm -hmm. That's going to tick somebody's box. But once grounded in that certainty, you can begin to reach out to the world with the same wonderful, generous vulnerability that we see in Christ. And that's the end of our second chapter. Remember, the title was Discovering God in Our Depths. And that's what we're going to be doing in the weeks ahead. Slowly discovering the beauty of God. Remember, we have feet of clay in divine DNA. Exciting stuff, people. Well, it excites me in a way. And I'm a bit weird, so, you know, here we go. If you don't want to be weird, I uh, suggest you go and eat popcorn somewhere else. But if you don't want to eat popcorn, you want to eat it with us, you feel free. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's a greatness that we have never yet seen. A greatness of you within us, in our own hearts, in the cave of our hearts. In the place where we have never ever been wounded. Heavenly Father, may we see this intimate and ultimate presence of our divine DNA in the world. I thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to, to pray together and journey together. It's only when we do it together can we help one another and share the greatness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. Thanks, everybody. If you would like to have a book, please phone All Saints Catholic Church. I know this is probably going to go out onto YouTube at, um, in other parishes. Ask your parish priest to phone me and I can deliver copies to your uh, parishes. But if you can't afford it, Sharon says you can just take it. Huh. Oh, I don't, I'm not there yet, people. 
Well, I am sending you something. You gotta give me the money. Not with Sharon. She just wants the book to be taken, okay? But if you want to buy the book, it's 150 Rand. If you want to be generous, pick two books for somebody who's got money to take. That's the way Sharon lives her life. A really great lady who's willing to share whatever she's got. She's not a rich person in the world, but she's very rich in her heart. Have a great week. See you next week. God bless.